So Van Gogh moved to Paris in February of 1886, and he stayed there till February of 1888, so almost exactly two years. And that Paris period was a great period of transformation for him as an artist. We could see from his Northern European phase, his Dutch phase, uh, how he was already ripe for transformation. There was something about his artistic language which was kind of insufficient for him. But it's really in Paris where the transformation takes place. And he's not the only non-French artist to find Paris an important site of transformation. You know, it's even been a city that has been called by Walter Benjamin the cap capital of the 19th century. You know, it's a really important art center. There were other important art centers, you know, for artists coming from Eastern Europe, maybe uh, Vienna was important and certain other uh, cities uh, played such a role. But Paris was the preeminent one. A lot of the breakthroughs in art in the 19th century happened there. Of course, cities in general tend to be where artistic breakthroughs occur. You, know, you can think of Florence in the 1400s in Italy. In the uh, 1940s and 50s, New York was really an important artistic capital. Um, so it's not surprising in a way. A lot of artists, and even when we're looking at post-impressionism, uh, he's a French artist, but Cézanne, he grew up in the south of France, he had to come to Paris to make a breakthrough. It really was the, what enabled his style to, to, to develop. It's partly that it's a great art education center, but that's not really the, the true totality of the story for Van Gogh because he's already a, quite mature as a person and as an artist by the time he comes to Paris. He's not there like a wide-eyed innocent but nevertheless he, he's learning something from this new city. And it, it, another point I want to make is that somehow it's not just going to Paris that's important but it's also leaving Paris is important both for Van Gogh and for Cézanne. They both had Parisian phases, but then a lot of their great work was made outside of Paris. Cézanne moved back to the south of France. Van Gogh moved to the south of France. Um, Gauguin, who was living in Paris when he becomes an artist, moves to the south of France and eventually uh, to Tahiti, also um, importantly to Brittany on the Atlantic French coast. So cities engaging and disengaging are important. Uh, uh, and it's partly about it, the artistic community you come in contact with there. Uh, although Van Gogh's style is very individual, um, art is in some sense a shared language, you know, and you, you need to um, dialogue with the other artists even to, to, to change that up language and discover your own individuality. We're looking at one of the works he made not so long after arriving in Paris. Um, so it's a quarry at Montmartre. This is 1886. So this is the year he arrived in Paris. And well, it's a Dutch artist painting a windmill in Paris. And we think of windmills as part of the characteristic uh, uh, scenery of the Dutch landscape and um, sometimes when emigrants go to a new country they settle in places that have scenery that are a little bit like home or in a way he's in Paris but he's already he's still got a bit of a Dutch vision you could say I can underline that point by showing you a painting by one of the lesser known Dutch uh, realist artists of this time Jacob Maris you know it's a, this is a Dutch the flatter Dutch landscape, not like the, uh, the hill of Montmartre in Paris that overlooks Paris, but uh, it's a, a landscape with windmills. And yeah, so there's not so great a difference between what Maris has done and what Van Gogh is doing here. Paris is just over that, that hill on the other side, the big city. But um, 
the sub sub suburbs have not really developed so far as they have today. Uh, and on the other side of the hill, you see what you could call allotments, small garden areas where people are growing things. And you see here a quarry. However, very quickly, there's a transformation. Here's pretty much the same scene from a slightly different angle. And it's really just the year uh, later, 1887, houses on the hill uh, Montmartre, or Montmartre gardens on the Boot Montmartre. We've just shifted our viewpoint along a little bit, but uh, otherwise it's pretty similar. We still see that windmill. The big transformation, of course, is then not the subject matter, but the style. It's a much, much brighter image. Instead of thinking tonally, instead of thinking in terms of light and dark, he's thinking more in terms of colour. The brush stroke is much more broken. We're much more aware of individual brush strokes. brighter colour. There's a sort of light white ground underneath all the paint which gives the whole image a greater luminosity. Much more sense of light I think. So a really big transformation. More interesting atmosphere. So change comes pretty quick for him when he's in Paris. He's got his brother there that can introduce him to what's going on. So he has a quick entree into the Parisian uh, world. He's primarily encountering Impressionism. Impressionism, as, as, we, as we know, is an art concerned with atmosphere, with light, painting with a much brighter palette. All of that Van Gogh has taken on and he takes it on very quickly. And I want to say he moves beyond it very quickly. Uh, already, this is not... He doesn't really go through a phase where he's a pure Impressionist and then he moves beyond it. He doesn't, he doesn't become a convert and then become disillusioned and move beyond. He absorbs him what he can from Impressionism and already he's starting to move beyond it very, very quickly. It's, there's something of, about a his personal style already coming through. Um, and another thing I would say about his relationship with Impressionism is that he, he remains interested in the works of the Impressionist artists like Monet, even in his later period when he's already found his own style. He, cause he's still looking at what Monet is doing, still learning things from Monet. And another thing I would say is that Things he sees in Paris, the influence of that is not just while he's in Paris. Sometimes it's like a kind of time bomb, you know, that it explodes later. The influence comes to fruition a little bit more slowly. So the effect of Paris is also on his later work, not on the, just on the work he does in, in Paris itself. One of the reasons why he's able to move beyond the Impressionism very quickly is that there's other artists who are already doing so. This is the artist Signac, and Signac is the most important follower of this artist, Seurat. Actually, we look at Seurat in his own right as part of the post-Impressionist generation. I actually f forgot to mention that fact last week. Seurat is sometimes called a post-impressionist, but sometimes he's called a neo-impressionist, new impressionist, uh, meaning, I suppose, to signify that his work is a little bit closer to impressionism than Van Gogh, Gauguin and Cezanne is. Seurat was quite a private person. Even his friends didn't know that much about his private life, for instance. You wouldn't see him around so much. So Van Gogh did meet uh, Seurat, but it was only just before he left Paris. His brother brokered an introduction. He went to uh, his studio.
but he would have seen this very important painting by Seurat, the Sunday afternoon on the island of the Grand Chat, uh, at the independent exhibition in August of 1886, so the year he arrived. And the work had only been painted a year or year to two before that. So it's very much contemporary art that he's looking at. This is the growing edge. An artist who's taken Impressionism's interest in light, luminosity, um, and modern life, but feels that Impressionism is just too informal. It needs some kind of ordering to it. And he's taken an almost scientific approach to systematize the broken brushwork of Impressionism. I think that's an influence on Van Gogh, but a lot of that influence may have come through a slightly lesser artist, Signac, who was, as I say, a sort of pupil of, of Seurat and very much a publicizer of Seurat's methods. He's more visible around town than Seurat himself was. He even wrote a book that, uh, you know, which kind of ended the story of modern art with his, his and Seurat's own movement. So the, the, the use of so much white, this is a typical thing in a, a Signac painting. It's a little bit of that in Van Gogh. Maybe it's closer to Signac than to Seurat in that, in that sense. But anyway, I'm saying he was aided beyond Impressionism by the work of Seurat and Signac. And also I think reading some books. Um, one of the reasons the academic artists in the 19th century didn't really like colour was because it wasn't as intellectual as study of a perspective or anatomy were thought to be. But that was changing during the 19th century. Some people were starting to look at colour scientifically. And uh, some of those scholars, uh, their work was uh, picked up by artists. Seurat was probably the most important who picked it up. But Van Gogh had written, uh, read a book by someone called Blanc, who talks about Delacroix's use of colour. And that's also a sort of influence on his thinking during this time, I believe. So you go to Paris and you see the art of the Impressionism. Remember, in an era before colour reproduction, he'd heard of Impressionism and he hadn't really got much sense of it in Holland. Black and white reproductions, what could you learn from that? Unless you see the actual paintings uh, at that time, it would be hard to... Uh, to have a sense of it. It's very much an art built around colour. But not just French art that he was learning about in Paris. He was learning about... Oh, let's show you another uh, work by Van Gogh that uh, shows, I think, a little bit more clearly the neo-impressionist or pointillist style of Seurat, the dotty kind of style. The idea was you put dots of pure colour side by side and they will then, uh, from the appropriate view viewing distance, they will blur in the eye and you'll have a greater sense of luminosity than if you mix the colours together on, on the canvas or even on the palette. That was the theory behind Seurat's style. But in Van Gogh's case, maybe that what should be a technical mannerism becomes a stylistic trait. Maybe it even does so in Seurat's own work, but anyway, certainly does here. You're aware of the individual dots. It becomes almost something decorative. Later artists like S S Matisse also find something decorative in that technique of, of Seurat. A cafe scene is a typical Impressionist subject. In the Impressionist life was centered around cafe culture, cafe and restaurant culture. They met as a group in, in, in such environments. Bourgeois kind of emerging spaces of leisure of the modern city. Another cafe scene. Uh, it's actually a portrait of a woman that Van Gogh had some kind of relationship with while he was in Paris, the cafe owner. Cafe du Tambourin. So this the, the the decor of this cafe is based around tambourines. You know the table tops look like tambourines. 
drums and so forth. She looks a little sad. This is the condition of modern urban life, of alienation. Van Gogh seemed to be picking up on that kind of a subject. It's not entirely new. You know, artists like Dugas had painted similar kinds of scenes and s dealt with the sim similar, the anomie, the alienation of modern life. Two people sitting together but not really conversing, a sense of separateness. Modern life, there's this growth of individualism. In one sense, that gives freedom, but it also can give loneliness, a sense of isolation. You know, there are two two sides to the coin. Uh, and Van Gogh is himself very much an artist, aware of all that. So he's not just interested in the art of any one individual impressionist artist. You know, I'm saying here maybe there's a touch of Dugas about this. The color scheme also reminds me a little bit of Renoir. Other works he's looking at Monet, absorbing different things, but not just French art. The, the other big influence that he absorbs in Paris is Japanese art, or to be a bit more specific, the art of the Japanese print. Again, to, to slightly belabor the point I made already, um, information flows that we take for granted today didn't exist at that time. So the great ink painting tradition of Japan would not have been known of in the West. There were no museums in which you could see great Japanese ink painting, uh, let alone the Chinese ink painting tradition. No such things e existed. So all they knew about was the Japanese woodblock prints. Basically that was it as regards two-dimensional images. And that is a modern art form. Some of those woodblock print artists were still alive. You know, this is art of that living, you know, of living artists that they were seeing. It's modern art, really. You could argue that uh, those Japanese woodblock prints are a, a kind of modern art. It's an art of a sophisticated urban center, Tokyo. From one urban center to another, there's something modern about the vision of the Japanese prints. And they're relatively, because they're, they're, uh, by the nature of prints, multiple copies exist, and therefore they're a little bit cheaper to um, to, to, to get hold of, uh, unlike um, the great ink paintings co which collectors would not want to, get, uh, to, to part with anyway, you know, you, you could get one even in Paris. Now, Van Gogh knew all about Japanese prints when he was in Holland. It wasn't actually that he discovered it in Paris. He and his brother were, 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 were very interested them, in them and already knew all about them, even had a, a, a kind of collection of them. If you go to the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, you can see some of the Japanese prints that Van Gogh himself owned. But it's not until he gets to Paris that somehow they become alive to him as an artistic influence. He was interested in them, but he, di he didn't connect it to what he himself was doing. But in Paris, somehow he could, you know. This is an interesting question of when does an influence come alive, you know, under what circumstances or preconditions allow you to be open to a certain thing, that it can transform you. So it's something about, until he'd seen Impressionism and learned something from Impressionism, he couldn't see how the visual world of the Japanese prints could have any direct relevance to his own practice as a painting, but this all changed in Paris. And in Paris, these things were much more available. There were periodicals in French about these things. There was an essay by Theodore Duret in 1884 called uh, La Japonais, the Japanese art. Um, there was a periodical even called um, Le Japan Artistique, the Artistic Japan, 
Um, there were novels like uh, a novel by someone called Lottie, uh, uh, wrote a novel which was actually the inspiration also for Madame Butterfly, the, the opera by uh, Puccini and so forth. So there are various sources uh, of information, some more reliable than others, uh, about Japan. There was shops you could go to. Madame de Soy had a shop uh, called um, La Porte Chinoise, where the oriental things were, were sold. Uh, Knickknacks of different kinds. Of so various sources of information uh, about things Japanese. Textual, physical objects. So he's learning, he's confronting the objects, but he's confronting the objects within a certain frame of interpretation, which may not be the same way we think about Japanese culture, uh, either as art historians or just in general. Uh, let me then kind of read out at you one or two things he says about Japan and its art, how he thought of it. He says, um, isn't it always a true religion which these simple Japanese teach us, who live in nature as though they themselves were flowers? The idea is Japanese people are very close to nature. You cannot study Japanese art, it seems to me, without becoming much gayer and happier. We must return to nature, in spite of the, our education, our work in the world of convention. So there's something sort of simple about Japanese art or close to nature. I envy the Japanese the extreme clearness which everything has in their work. There's also a kind of economy about it that he likes. It is never tedious and never seeming to be done too hurriedly. Their work is as simple as breathing and they do a figure in a few sure strokes with the same ease as if it were as simple as buttoning your coat. Oh, someday I must manage to do a figure in a few strokes. That will keep me busy all winter. Once I can do that, I shall be able to do people strolling on the boulevards, in the streets, and heaps of new subjects. So I think this is the primary artistic kind of influence, the sense that he's seeing in Japanese prints an economy of means. He can simplify his own art. Therefore, he can escape from um, the detailed realism that he'd learnt. Uh, in Holland. More, in more detailed sense you can say he takes from the Japanese woodblock prints a heightened colour, a flattening of space, often using even complementary colours, very bold design ideas, cropping images sometimes, con very strong sense of contouring. All of these are different formal qualities we see in his mature work which are there in the Japanese print. It's partly because of the Japanese aesthetic, which is not bought in, like Chinese aesthetic also, not bought into a notion of realism, illusionism. That was never part of the, the aesthetic. But it's also partly to do with the specific qualities of prints as a medium. You know, you, you, in a, a woodblock print, you have to simplify things to print. You can't have the very fine detail you could in an oil painting. What Van Gogh actually does is to confront this question of the possibilities offered by the Japanese print. His initial response is how to deal with this. It's something really culturally alien. It's a little bit more difficult to deal with than Impressionism, which he seems to have leapt straight into and devoured very quickly. Uh, his approach is an interesting one. He, he makes copies of basically of three Japanese prints. I call them copies, but you could say translations, if you like. I think uh, I prefer the translation because you're translating from one medium to another, from print to oil paint. That's already a, a translation. It's also a kind of cultural translation, too. The, Jap the Japanese prints don't tell you how to <coughs> use them, how to translate them. He still has to think a lot about how to do do it, but nevertheless, it's a little bit easier to just devour them, devour them whole, as it were. 
and then digest them later rather than to try and pick and choose from the beginning what he's going to do. So that's what he's done here. This is one of those three uh, copies he's made of Japanese print by uh, print artist Hiroshige. He's added to it a little frame with some kanji, hanji, kanji, whatever, Chinese, Chinese characters, but from Japan, um, to make a, a sort of decorative border, if you like. So there's a little bit of invention going on, but not, not so much. He doesn't copy slavishly. He changes details, heightens the color and so forth. See how he's using complementary colors within the same painting, the green and the red. This is all very bold. These are colors that are not naturalistic. You know, what would that red be in reality? You know, but it's all what excuse in reality would there be for that, that red? The greater abstractness from reality of East Asian art is given him permission. This is, if you like, vision in crisis, encountering completely different cultures with their own ways of looking at the world, and suddenly a sense of relativation, relativization of your own way of looking at the world. And maybe that in that is something of a possibility. It could be something negative that suddenly things the firm ground under your feet uh, is disappeared. That could be something frightening almost, but uh, it also could allow certain possibility. Fluidity could be a good thing. Others, you might learn something good from other cultures. Copying and Van Gogh, it's not the only time he copies. He copies as a, as a student, if you like, uh, but he copies right through to the very end of his life, the last year of his life. For example, when he's ill and he can't go out and paint in the landscape, which he liked to do. Uh, one strategy he had for that was to, uh, to, to, to make copies. <coughs> so copying we associate maybe more with student work, not with mature artists, or we associate it with the academic study method, not with modern art. But here is a kind of modern art copy, if you like, something a little bit different. I like, I'm actually quite interested in this theme of opacity of writing in, in images. You know, these are, these are words that he, he can't read and he, his audience can't read. So you, yet you have a sense that there is language there he, he just takes things, copies characters from here and there and doesn't really have any relevance to the meaning of the, the image. I'm jumping ahead in time. I'm going to look at the other copies of Japanese prints he made, but jumping ahead in time to look at a slightly later work which deals with um, the, you know, the same theme that was in his copy of a, a Japanese print to show how some of the aesthetic of the Japanese print is still there in uh, his own autonomous work. In this case, he is painting from nature, uh, yet he's got the Japanese aesthetic influences, which are now in a more digested form, thanks to his strategy of copying. He's managed to take on board something. Just a, a portrait, if you, I feel I want to call it a portrait of an individual tree. pear tree in blossom. It's actually from his south of France phase, well, after he's left Paris, moving to the south of France. And it's one of the most important themes of the early phase of, of his time in Arles, in the south of France, is blossom. He, he, the first one he does is just a, a blossom of a, of a fruit tree. He takes it indoors. It's still too cold, but he takes it indoors and makes a still life of it, paints it in, in, uh, indoors. But then he goes out to, to paint the blossom. And he goes on with that theme until all the blossoms have gone and the subject is no longer possible. So I think it's very much, um, he's very much an artist with strong sense of the seasons. 
So this is very much sp spring, the beginning of the warm weather coming. Um, and blossom, because it's a, he likes to paint flowers, many paintings of flowers, but the flowers of a fruit tree, they also make, make you think of autumn, of fruition. Those flowers are the harbingers, the, the messengers of the fruit which we will have in the harvest. You know, when, we, when we come to the, the plums, the pears, the apples, whatever, that we will be able to pick. So when it, it, it speaks about spring, but it also, by contrast to winter, you know, when he was in Holland, there were many, there were many images he made of trees with bare, lea bare branches representing winter. This, I think, should be seen in contrast to that. I think he's an artist who very much thinks in terms of contrast. So it's about the, the joy of living, if you like, very affirmative because of uh, the color, the bright color. And that's partly something from impressions and partly something from the Japanese print. The uh, strong contouring, that's also something from the Japanese print and the slightly angular treatment, stylization of the tree. Surely that's something from the Japanese print. And the flattening out of space, the break with Renaissance perspective, the sense of a, the image as a window through a world, that's also something uh, from the Japanese print, I think. Bright colors, arbitrary almost. And the subject as well, the, the, the sakura, you know, the, the uh, fruit trees, blossoming in Japan is a big cultural phenomenon uh, and I think he must have heard about that and the symbolism about about the the beauty but the effervescence of beauty the, the, the transitoriness of beauty all that is is part of what's here in the meaning of the work he's trying to do something more than just paint light in nature as an impressionist painter does he wants to give you some greater meanings. There's a sort of spiritual intensity about it. The way he's focused on that one tree, almost a sort of visionary focus on that one tree in its full suchness. The Impressionist vision is a very unemphatic, even vision. Everything there is equally important in the whole scene. No one thing is more important than any other. And I think that's something that Van Gogh couldn't quite live with. He wanted to move beyond. Uh, so that we're very much focused on that one tree. It's a little bit like the English romantic painter, poet, William Blake, you know, talking about seeing the universe in a grain of sand. You know, that's a visionary, almost sort of like uh, heightened ecstatic attention to nature. An even vision that viewed everything the same, um, a slightly unhumanistic vision of impressionism is something he's not quite happy with. And even the impressionists themselves, as I said last week, start to move beyond that. Maybe the moment Monet becomes dissatisfied himself with that vision was when his wife died, Camille. When she died, uh, he did something which might sound a bit gruesome to us, but is actually pretty common practice at that time. He painted her on her deathbed. And he actually became a little bit shocked at himself that he was just painting his wife's face as just another object with light falling on it, you know. Somehow that's like discovering the limits of Impressionism as a vision. That it treats everything the same, even if, even if that thing is your, your, your wife who's just died, you know. So that's the, the kind of thinking that um, leads to this change of style. All these factors are playing into this, I think. Just to give you one more of these flowering fruit trees. As I said, there are many of them. In the south of France, that area, there were quite strong winds, so the, the farmers' gardens would put up these fences to help to break the wind. They would also 
plant uh, cypress trees to do the same thing. Here's another of the jumping back now <laughs> to the Paris phase. This is another of the copies he made of Japanese prints. Again, Hir Hiroshige. You see how it must have been really interesting to these artists to see a whole way of composing that's so different. So there's nothing in the foreground and then there is this bridge which suddenly appears and then suddenly disappears. You know, there's a, it's so different from the compositional format that uh, Western artists would have grown up with. The artists like Poussin and Claude with, well, first you establish a foreground and you gradually you lead the eye back into depth. You maybe you need a winding road or a river or something to do that. And maybe you have some trees at either side of the painting to frame the view. Uh, nothing, you know, pow, just a bridge suddenly coming in and that's okay. And that bridge flattens out the space of the painting as a result. It's suddenly uh, a leap from the bridge to, you know, deep space behind. Your eye isn't gradually brought, brought back. So that has a sort of flattening uh, effect really. So all this is a, a learning a new way of thinking. Again, he's added this decorative border. Uh, this is a terrible slide, sorry, but just to put his painting next to the original that uh, he was making a copy of, so you can see the translation. But this particular original is the one Van Gogh himself owned, so it was in his possession and now in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Rain as a subject, I mean, it, all this would have been dramatically new. You, you try and find a Western landscape painting where there is rain, you know, coming and destroying your whole view of the landscape, you know, you just it's like erasing the, the landscape. That's a, such a radical new way of thinking about it, about it, that no Western artist up to that time would have, would have considered. It just would have been really strange. I, I think this must have been the last of the three copies of Japanese prints he made. Um, anyway, it's the most elaborate. That's why I think it's the last. He seems to be getting a little bit more confident now about, about it. So he's got a very elaborate border, border to it. It's a print of a, an actor, and then he's got a, this sort of landscape setting to it. So he's put two different things together. You can see his source in an illustrated uh, magazine, you know, uh, he's taken it, he's, he's made a c copy uh, by tracing. This is the original, this is how it appears in the French magazine, already translated, inverted. He's not the only artist who's interested in Japan. I, I should, of course, emphasize that. The Impressionists themselves had been interested in Japan. So here's Monet uh, making uh, a picture of a... She's obviously not a Japanese woman. She's very blonde. Uh, she's dressing up in Japanese clothes and with J Japanese fans. Japanesery. So it's a very superficial engagement with appropriating the other, just interest in the objects. Monet hasn't managed to let, at least in this work, he hasn't managed to let the Japanese aesthetic influence his aesthetic. It's just a, a kind of the curiosity of, a, of some, some kind of exotic objects. Probably it would be easier to sell this work, you know, it's got a certain curiosity value. He, he actually says something like that himself, you know, that, well, this is just a, a pot boiler, something like that, something to, to make a bit of money. So sometimes you engage with otherness in a way that you don't actually, you know, 
give up anything of your own. Very tame engagement with otherness. It has, he hasn't allowed in this work a, a, a vision to be in crisis, but maybe sometimes that's a good thing. Another artist, probably one of the first, is actually an American artist, but he was based in Paris, Whistler, the princess from the land of porcelain. It's a little bit like that Monet in that it's all about Japanese costume. And again, it's a non-Japanese woman dressing up in uh, Japanese costume. But Whistler has allowed the style of the image to be a little bit influenced, like the elongation of the figure's pose. Uh, that's a, a slight break from realism that you could say is influenced by uh, the Japanese print aesthetic. So Wh Whistler overall, although he's one of the first to be interested in Japanese art, he's already goes a little bit further than many of the later artists in allowing it to influence his, his style. It's the same Japanese prints, basically, that different artists are looking at. Whistler and Impressionists are looking at it, and they are influenced a little bit to produce works in their style. And then uh, the post-Impressionists, who completely reject the Impressionist style in many ways, and find, him, like Van Gogh, they find Japanese print one of the main resources they can use to, to do that transformation. So it's something a little bit paradoxical in a way, two people looking at the same thing and finding almost the opposite in it. You know, it's, it's, a, it's how much is from Japan and how much is from their way of take, taking Japan or understanding Japan. Uh, of course, Japan, Japanese art is rich, so there are many things in it. You can take different things from it. It's not surprising. Um, but Impressionists and post-Impressionists, both interested in Japan, but really seeing, using it in different ways. Okay, I think that's enough for today. So next week we will look at Van Gogh's work in the south of France, the, the mature phase of his art that is his most well-known phase. And if we have time, we'll start looking at the work of Gauguin as well. But let, let we, I'm going to go fairly slowly. You've probably picked that up already to start with. I'll gather more momentum as we go along. Uh, to begin with, I have to add a little bit more context in. I don't know, dif different ones of you will have had different amount of background. So uh, some things I say some of you will be very familiar with, others maybe not so but uh, I'll go a little bit more slowly to start with and we we'll gradually will develop confidence and go a little bit faster perhaps.